Yes, I'm one of the members here at Christchurch, and it is really good to be here with you this morning, in the air, this morning. When I say a few minutes, So a few moments ago, we heard and we read from John's gospel about this incredible encounter between Jesus and a Samaritan woman. And I mean, this is quite some encounter. It breaks about a billion taboos. It dives into some incredibly deep theology. And it, it wonderfully transforms this woman's this woman's life. The person collecting water at the beginning is not the same woman who runs into her village at the end with unabandoned joy. And we skipped that last section, sorry, but that's the end of the story. Notice, by the way, that John gives us this story right after Jesus' encounter with Nicodemus just a few verses before. And of course, that is no coincidence. More of that in a moment. But above all, I've chosen this story and I love this story because it has so much to say to you and me sitting here in this church in Luton in 2024. Maybe you won't be the same at the end of this encounter either. Okay, so let's get started. So the first thing we've got to do is actually talk about how this woman has been so horrendously caricatured by people making assumptions about her. The story, as I've heard it in a thousand sermons, is that here's a sinful woman. She's got through five husbands, and now she's living with a man. We are so quick to throw the first stone. Christians have called her immoral, a sex worker. I mean, they couldn't have a lower opinion of this woman if they tried. At best, it's a misunderstanding. That is true. At best, it's a misunderstanding. At worst, it's a kind of misogyny that's still rife in our culture And so much of the time, I'm afraid, the church. The problem is, we read the Bible through 21st century eyes without realizing it. This isn't the modern Western world. It's 2,000 years ago in a different culture. Women are the property of men. They don't get to divorce or leave a man. They don't get to choose a husband. They're married by the arrangement of their father with or without their consent usually at a very young age, 12 or 13, and to a much older man. They don't get educated, they don't have careers, or bank accounts, or equal pay, or many rights at all. Marrying an older man at a time when life expectancy was low would have meant it would not be uncommon for a woman to be widowed. At that point, they would have been passed to one of his brothers as a second wife. That man might die, and if so, they would be passed on to another family member. To have that happen five times would have been unusual, but not impossible. Back in the Gospel of Mark, in chapter 22, for those of you that are kind of gospel nerds, you might remember there's a moment when the Pharisees try and catch Jesus out with a trick question about a woman who's been married that little seven different times and who she is going to be married to in heaven. You remember that little piece? Uh, so having many husbands through being widowed is common enough to be talked about. There's a further twist. If a woman remained childless in this culture, she would be given to one of the brothers in what was called a leveret marriage. 
She would live with him, but he would not technically be her husband. That is what Jesus is referring to when he says, the man you are living with is not your husband. Notice Jesus never talks about the woman's sin or challenges her about her life throughout the whole conversation. Her story is not scandalous. It's tragic. And her encounter with Jesus is not about immorality. It's about her identity. By the way, as an aside, this Moose reading is exactly the kind of mistake you slip into when you reduce the Bible to one long story of sin and forgiveness, moral depravity and repentance. This is a habit Christians cannot seem to break. The Bible is not a story about morality. It's a story about our identity, about who you are. A human made in the image of God. Why do we miss that and end up with a book of rules for life? Don't get me wrong. The Bible has many clear injunctions about how we should live. But they flow from who we are. So you can imagine why this five times bereaved woman might be ostracized by her community, can't you? Don't go near her. Don't touch her. If you touch her, you'll be dead. Man. Who goes near her dies. So a woman who's been living a nightmare, who's been broken by what life has dealt her, finds herself having to come alone to the well in the heat of the day until this day, the day she meets Jesus. So let's get into the story a little bit more. Here's Jesus sitting by the well. It's hot and dry. He's exhausted and thirsty. The well, by the way, would have been a deep hole with a kind of donut-shaped stone over the top that would keep the dust out. There's no bucket and rope. You use your own. And, of course, Jesus doesn't have one. The woman approaches the well, and Jesus asks for a drink. Do you hear it? The sound of cultural taboos being shattered. In this culture, as a man and a rabbi, Jesus would have been expected to withdraw 10 or so meters away as the woman approached. He doesn't. He sits there right by the well. In this culture, he wouldn't have talked to the woman. He wouldn't have even made eye contact with the woman. He does. He starts a conversation. That separation between men and women is prevalent in lots of parts of the world. And it's true also of other faiths in our country. Our, this is Helen and I, our wonderful Muslim neighbors. They're just the loveliest family. We've lived next door to them for 14 years. And I've chatted with the father hundreds of times. I've never spoken to his wife. I've never made eye contact with his wife or she with me. This is just the way things are. Jesus ignores these taboos. But trust me, he is only just getting started. Because this woman is also a Samaritan. You might know a bit about this. The Samaritans and Jews have been locked in a bitter and bloody conflict for hundreds of years. They actually came from the same heritage. But when a bunch of thugs called the Assyrians, sorry if you've got Assyrian heritage, uh, you probably haven't, uh, had invaded Israel hundreds of years earlier, the people in one region of Israel, Samaria, intermarried with them and ended up building their own temple and mixing the Jewish faith with Assyrian traditions. This led to a deep feud between Jews and Samaritans. The Samaritans sided with the Romans when they invaded. In fact, some of the Roman soldiers in Israel would have been co-opted Samaritans. There's even some possibility that the Roman soldiers who crucified Jesus might have been Samaritans. 
The Samaritans didn't venture into Israel, especially on their own. Hence the scandal of the parable of the, of the Good Samaritan. And Jews did not enter Samaria because they risked attack. If they did, they traveled in large groups. So Jesus asking the Samaritan woman for a drink using her bucket would have been unthinkable. It would have defiled him, made him unclean. But he does it anyway. And it's not just that. There's something, maybe you've noticed it, there's something beautiful happening here. Notice that Jesus humbles himself by needing something from her rather than by starting by telling her who he is. His opening words to her in verse 7 might be sort of summarized as, I am weak and need help. Can you help me? He's placing value on her, something that no one has done for a long time. So the conversation begins, and it's remarkable, it's deep, it's theological. They go back and forth discussing worship, the spirit, living water, the correct geographical position for the temple. It's hard to keep up. You know, what strikes me, though, is that Jesus converses with her on exactly the same level as he does with Nicodemus a few verses earlier, as an equal. Two conversations. One with Nicodemus coming to Jesus by night, a Pharisee, a member of the Jewish ruling council, educated, the highest status in society. The other, an ostracized, uh, uh, an ostracized Samaritan woman coming to Jesus by day, five times bereaved, uneducated, at the bottom of society. But Jesus treats them the same. He doesn't talk down to this woman in any way. In his eyes, she is no different to Nicodemus. Of course, the conversations end differently. Nicodemus cannot get his head around the new identity Jesus is offering when you're born of the Spirit. But the Samaritan woman welcomes this new identity, perhaps precisely because she's at the other end of the power spectrum. She recognizes not just who Jesus is, but what he is offering. So, I think this is starting to help us see what this conversation, I think, is all about. Jesus is announcing a new order where everyone can meet God. In the world the Samaritan woman occupied, access to God was limited. It was limited by geography. God actually dwelt in the temple in Jerusalem. All it was were 20 miles from Jerusalem. You were 20 miles from God. That wasn't all. It was limited by gender. If you were a woman, you were excluded from most of the temple. You couldn't come close to God. You only were permitted in the outer courts. There's more. It was limited by ethnicity as far as the Israelites were concerned. God was not available to the Samaritans. They could never enter any part of the temple, not even the outer courts. All these barriers to meeting with God, all these reasons you would be excluded left out, ignored. But Jesus is going to change all that. The gospel is going to break these barriers. The patriarchy, the misogyny, the racism, the exclusivity, the gospel is going to smash them all. That's what Jesus is saying in verse 21. Uh, this is the sort of the climax of the conversation because it's a long conversation. You might need to go back and read it after this. But in verse 21, there's the big reveal. Jesus says, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. A time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Jesus says there's a new order coming. And in fact, it's already here. In this new order, the sacred space where God dwells is not geographical. 
Notice, by the way, he says, you will worship. Women didn't get to worship in the old order. Samaritans didn't get to worship. But the Spirit is coming, and now anyone can meet God anywhere. Everyone can call God their father. Did you notice Jesus slips that in too? He's no longer distant and separated. He's a father to the Samaritan woman. To suggest that a Samaritan could have addressed God as a father is scandalous. This is not a story about immorality, about a woman caught in sin. It was never that. It's a story about a new identity in Christ that breaks everything that separates and divides us from each other and from God. And who better to announce this to than a woman who has been broken by so much, who is ostracized and separated from her community. She, much more than Nicodemus, can recognize what's being offered. So what does this mean for us? It means God is available by his spirit to everyone, whatever their status, whatever their story. The man I see begging outside Starbucks by the train station most mornings, and the man in a flashy suit getting on the train to London and his well-paid job. The sex worker standing in the bitter cold on Dudley Street, and the couple walking by, hand in hand, trying to ignore her. The Afghani refugees in a one-room bed and breakfast in Limbury, and the family living in one of the blinged-up houses on the New Bedford Road. The single mum trying to bring up three kids, the elderly man living alone in the flats opposite this church, the man in the co-op round the corner, buying a pint of milk in his pajamas, that's probably happening right now. I've seen that happen. Who goes to the co-op in their pajamas, for goodness sake? The world has literally gone mad. And you. This is for you. This is the good news of the gospel. Have you heard it? Have you really heard it? Make us and if in any way as a woman you have experienced misogyny or had people make assumptions about you, hear the good news of the gospel. If you've ever been ignored, excluded, found yourself on the outside, hear the good news of the gospel. We meet so many people in my work at Youthscape who've been broken by life, so many young people. I was thinking of one lad whose father tried to kill him and his mother. He's now in prison. And this lad bullied and ostracized at school. It ended up with the school asking if he could come on one of our courses at Butte Mills. And then he started coming to our after-school drop-in, and then to our Friday night Christian events, and then to satellites, our summer camp. And he met Christians who treated him with love and respect. And through them, he met Jesus, who is now changing his life for the better. God meets him where he is by his spirit, and he can call him father. This is the power of the message Jesus is sharing in his story. A final twist in the last few minutes. I promise we've got time-ish. Let's go back to the very beginning, verse 4. It says, did you notice this? Jesus had to go through Samaria. Jesus had to. Did you notice that? But the thing is, he didn't. Nobody did. We already know that the animosity between the Sam Samaritans and Jews was so deep that you risked attack if you went in Samaria. So people went round Samaria rather than through it. That was actually the normal thing to do. But Jesus had to go through Samaria. Why? Why does John use that phrase? Because that was the only way he got to meet this woman. That was the only way this conversation could have happened. 
the only way this woman could find a new life, which by the way, she immediately tells her whole village about and becomes an amazing evangelist. Jesus had to divert from the normal route to have this encounter. I wonder about what that means for you, for me, for us as a church. So I'm thinking, where is Samaria for us, for you? Where are the places, the people, the experiences that I walk around? Because it's inconvenient or scary or they're just not the kind of people I want to meet. This good news of the gospel is too important to play safe. So let me ask you, where do you need to go out of your way this week to meet your equivalent? a Samaritan woman. The great preacher and leader, Dr. Martin Luther King, said this, without him, life is a meaningless drama with the decisive scenes missing. But with him, we were able to rise from the fatigue of despair to the buoyancy of hope. With him, we are able to rise from the midnight of desperation to the daybreak of joy. That was true for the Samaritan woman. It's true for you. And it can be true for those you dare meet this week. Let's just pray together. Lord, this glorious, amazing, powerful woman, we thank you for her and for her story. Her transformation and her identity is glorious. We pray that her story would inspire us this morning to go out of our way to meet those in our own Samaria and to bring this story of a gospel that is open to everyone. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for being so patient. I don't know what I'm supposed to do now. Who's next?